God is good. I welcome you all in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think you will agree with me that it's a great privilege to be here this morning, to be alive, to be well, and to be healthy. For those who do not know me, my name is Pastor Andri Spitter, and I'm the regional leader of the Gauteng North region. I was asked by the president of the AFM of South Africa, Dr. Henry Vederman, to introduce to you the, the speaker of today and to make a few announcements also. So please bear in mind, firstly, put off your cell phone. Please, if it's going to ring, you must buy pizzas for everybody here. So please just make sure that it's been switched off. Thank you for your participation. Dear people, there are two PCD workshops today. The first one here is in an auditorium that will be led by Pastor George Moslobo. And then in the auditorium number two, at the same time, Dr. Johan Serfontein will address a different topic. And then half past two, those who are here this morning in this auditorium, Number one, you are welcome to, to, to stay here because then Dr. Jan Serfontein will be here and Pastor George Moslobo will be in auditorium number two. Is that fine? Everybody, thank you so much for hearing me. At this stage, before I'm, I'm going to do anything else, can we just stand and just devote ourselves to our Lord Jesus Christ for a moment or two? Please just make sure that you say, Holy Spirit, speak to me. You are welcome in this place. We are welcoming you just for one minute or so, just to stretch our legs. Thank you so much. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are good. Holy Spirit, come and tell us more about his lovely name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, it's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you. We worship you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We adore you, Lord. We magnify your name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You are so welcome here this morning. We worship you. We worship you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. For those who come late, please just make sure that your cell phone has been switched off. I also have somebody very important here that wants to make an announcement. I'm going to ask uh, David Miller to come forth and just say a few minutes uh, what is on his heart. Thank you so much, David. Thank you very much, Pastor. Good uh, afternoon, morning, everyone. And thank you for this flash opportunity to share with you just a quick thought. Um, thank you, Pastor George, for letting me have two minutes of your time. Uh, there is this book that is presented in the uh, foyer area. It is a book that is written by Dr. J.J. Laporta, the former deputy president of the church. It is a compilation of some thoughts and also a, a biography that is being presented by him. This time, it is going at a special price of only, only 250 rand. So if you would like to hear something about his story, you are more than welcome, not now, not now, after the session. Then you can go down to the foyer and you can get yourself a copy of this book. It is titled, You're Better Than What People Say About You or What They Think or What You Think About Yourself. Definitely a read not to be missed. And I trust that we will sell it out today at 250. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Gentle people, it gives me a great privilege this morning to introduce to you Pastor George Moslobo. For you who don't know him that well, please listen very carefully 
because you will find some amazing facts about him. Pastor Mukpikulele George Moshloba was born on the 22nd of April in 1954 in Fukusake. For the Afrikaans people, that is in Volksrust, in the Mamapumba Langa province of South Africa. He is the firstborn child to the late Islima and the late Eliot Moshloba. Pastor George's siblings are two sisters, Gabi and Tabili, and the other two, a brother and a sister who passed on. Pastor George is married to Jakobev Mabeli Moshlobo on the 14th of July, 1978. Pastor George attended primary school at Fukuzaki Folksres and high school at Semi Secondary School in Dagekral, near Amersfoort, and at a Freyheid High School in Beko Zulu, near Freyheid. He obtained his diploma in theology from the Central Bible College in 1978 and his Bachelor of Theology degree from the University of Pretoria in 1984. Pastor George was licensed as a pastor on March 11, 1978 and was subsequently ordained on March 31, 1979. He has served as an ordained AFM of South Africa pastor since 1979 at the following AFM assemblies. Mashadadov from 1978 to 1980. Mabupani, 1980 to 1985. Pucha Ditaba, 1985 to 1999. Adoxa Dew Inner Campus, the City Inner Campus as part of a ministry team, 1999 to 2004, and at the AFM Hilltop Restoration Center in Shoshongovi since 2004 to date. In all these assemblies, Pastor George has never asked for a salary increase, but the Lord has always provided. He has successfully pastored this current assembly, AFM Hilltop, Restoration Center for less than 50 members, up to more than close to 400, together with the governing body without any donations. They managed to put up a church structure, which is above $2 million. And Pastor George is trusting Lord for providing these funds before the end of this year. Let's trust the Lord also for that. God can do anything. Can I have an Amen. From AFM Hilltop Restoration Center, he has managed to produce seven pastors. He served as a principal of the AFM of South Africa Theological Institute, 1994 to 1996. The ministry portfolios within the AFM of South Africa, in which he also served, are... He was the national youth leader from 1980 to 1988. He was the secretary of the Committee for Unity from 1986 to 1988. He was the secretary of the Presbytery from 1988 to 1990. He's the secretary of the AFM Lahazen Committee from 1990 to 1996. He was the general secretary of the former AFM African section from 1988 to 1990. He was the General Secretary of the AFM Composite Division from 1990 to 1996. He was the General Secretary of the AFM of United Church, the AFM of South Africa United Church from 1996 to 2016. He was the Secretary of the AFM International since 2013 to 2016 and the pre president of the AFM of South Africa from 2016 up to 2021. Pastor George is currently serving as a member on the NLF and the president of the AFM International since 2016 to date. Have portfolios outside the AFM Pastor George served as the director at the Impact Community Radio Station and Pop-Up. His ministry has taken him to five continents and many countries of the world. 
He has been to the length and breadth of our country, and he keeps himself informed through current media news from the press, TV, and the internet. His hobbies include traditional and Christian gospel music, and he enjoys watching soccer. And if you want to treat him, he likes and he has a particular interest in a wild game. We honor our Lord Jesus Christ for this special man. For he is, he has graced Pastor George to role model servant leadership. And although there were many, many difficult times and many challenges, Pastor George did not give up. It is a motivation to us all not only to finish the race, but to finish it well. Pastor George, we thank you for your brilliant leadership, your humbleness and kind and gentle way of addressing very important and difficult issues. The AFM, national and international, wants to honor you and say thank you for your leadership internationally, nationally, locally, in your region, in your assembly, wherever you go. We are looking forward to see what God has still in store for you. I believe everyone that knows him will and can say, I have learned from Pastor George Moschlobo. Your race is not finished, Pastor George, but we can see you walk the walk with dignity and integrity. Before I'm going to call him in front, I just want to show you that the book that was published by an author that that had several conversations with Pastor George, and maybe just in short, a summary of this brilliant book. Like a good student, the first chapter is about this book. He motivates the, the methodology that they are using and why it is good to do it that way. But secondly, you will read a chapter that is fascinating because it's describing his, his childhood and his is uh, developing years to actually to lead to the presidency. But thirdly, he speaks also about the power of a good name. And fourthly, there is something amazing about persistent principle leadership. And you will hear more about that, believe me. And he as a mentor has very good news. And he can always be called to help you to to handle those difficult people or challenging people, they, those who are CEOs and those people who are influential in the community. He mentors those people, so you are welcome also to, to learn from him. But also what fascinates me in this book is how he addressed the, the very difficult challenge by managing difficult people. And... Uh, he also gave a holistic approach about uh, the kingdom of issues faith, and you can learn more about it. But it's important for, for us to, to see how he expressed the way of leaving a legacy. We all have to leave a legacy, and inheritance matters. And then he also gives very, very, very good advice to parents, very, very good advice to congregant members, and very good advice to people who want to become a pastor or just ministry-related issues, who wants to become a leader. You can find that information in that book. And as a good student, he always gives an afterthought of this book and about his life. But chapter 13 is also about the collaborative testimonies and the people that he made an impact in their lives. And uh, you will enjoy it. I can promise you, you can read this whole book in a weekend. When I took it, I could not put it down. It was so fascinating to me. So I would like to ask you gently, would you please stand and let's give Pastor George Muslobo a welcome applause to the pulpit. Thank you, Pastor George Muslobo. Thank you very much. You may take your seats. 
Um, Dr. Andres Peter is my regional leader. Uh, I and my congregation submit to him. Um, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to thank the office bearers of the AFM of SA who extended an invitation that I should uh, come and share some of the thoughts that uh, are in my book and some of the things <clears throat> that I have experienced. And I would like uh, to also acknowledge all of our co-workers who are here and uh, all church representatives that are here. It is my prayer that uh, the Lord will indeed impact us in such a way that uh, we will be able uh, to brave the storm and uh, forge ahead. Um, I'm grateful to God because uh, uh, the Lord called me when I was very, very young, and uh, it was about 45 years ago when he called me, and uh, he gave me an opportunity even before I became a pastor to serve uh, in the student Christian ministries in uh, various institutions. And uh, it was a privilege for me to have that dimension. But the Lord has also been good to me in the sense that uh, he called me to serve in the AFM. I have now been an ordained pastor here for about 45 years, and I give him glory. But on the other hand, most of you would recall that I have served as uh, the general secretary. Before the unity, I served as uh, the general secretary for nine years. And uh, from unity 1996 to 2016, I continued to serve as general secretary for 20 years which means the Lord was good to allow me to serve for 28 or 29 years. So I am grateful also to your prayers. In 2020, I got infected when I had been to some of the funerals of our pastors, and I landed in a high care, in a hospital, and uh, I'm grateful to be alive. Uh, I'm grateful that the Lord has been gracious that uh, I can still do something for him. So, in this session, I would just like to uh, talk to some of the leadership aspect that were important and that guided me uh, in all these roles that I have just mentioned. The focus of uh, my presentation, firstly, would be on the concept of Ubuntu. It has to do with personality. Secondly, it will also deal with the question of a leader and relationships, which has to do with the proximity uh, of those that are close to you. And the third one would be about diligence. Uh, which has to do about performance, how do you perform. The fourth one would be about integrity, uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, principles that are anchored on certain values. And uh, the last one, the leader and the vision, which basically deals with uh, purpose in leadership. Let us start, first of all, with this concept of uh, Ubuntu. As you will see, when I'm talking about Ubuntu, there will be a number of other principles that you are aware of that I will be latching on. I have chosen this concept because it encompasses all of the other issues that have helped me in uh, my journey. 
Um, normally, when we talk about Ubuntu, we use phrases uh, in order to try and explain what is it that we're talking about, uh, because um, sometimes it is very difficult to explain it. One of the phrases that we use is, I am because we are. And uh, the other one is, I am who I am because of who you are. So when you are a leader, it is important that uh, you recognize uh, that your leadership is intrinsically related to those people that you are leading. And that um, the adding of value is not a one way. It is reciprocal. In as much as you impart what God has given to you, to the people, uh, they are also uh, giving you a motivation. So, as a leader, it has been helpful for me to make sure that um, I keep the principles of Ubuntu. In other words, that I show humanity to others. As long as I can stand, when somebody greets me, I will stand. It doesn't matter whether it's a young man, whether it's a, a, a Sunday school child, because uh, when I stand, I show that uh, I value that person, I respect that person. There is nothing that makes me better than that person. It's only by grace of God that I am doing what I am. So it is important that in leadership uh, we keep the whole aspect of uh, showing humanity. When you do that, uh, you are embracing the biblical principle that we are all equal before the Lord. And when you lead, don't uh, make people feel that you are not a uh, part of those that you are leading. Try and come closer to people. It has helped me. Try even to speak their language, to do their dance, and so on and so on. So, as a leader, in our own situation, we therefore need to embrace the principle of uh, equality of humanity. And thirdly, when we talk of uh, Ubuntu, we are talking also of uh, a caring attitude, a caring attitude. Now, I have been a pastor for quite a long time. Now, in our culture, when I was in Kwakwa, then they would say, Ntate Muruti. I have found it very, very difficult to translate that into English. It's something like, Dedi Pasta. What does this mean? It means you are not just a professional to them. You are a parent. And uh, therefore, the way you handle them you also recognize that they are giving you that space of uh, parenting them, and therefore, you need to show care. I have discovered that the success of a pastor in leadership is not only behind the pulpit. Uh, the pulpit uh, only makes a short, short, short input, but it is how you interact with people especially when people are going through difficult times. Now, I want to make an illustration uh, which comes from a satire that was written by George Orwell. The title of that satire is Animal Farm. Now, we, when you read the whole thing about the satire, it was written during the Second World War. And uh, when you read about it, it's these animals in the farm who wanted to rebel against the farmer. And uh, they then decided to put a few things in place. One of those were the seven commandments. 
One, the first one was, whenever, whatever goes up upon two legs is an enemy. Now you can see that it's animals talking. They are trying to say, this farmer walks on two legs, so the farmer is an enemy. Whatever goes upon four legs or has wings is a friend. No animal should wear clothes. No animal shall sleep in a bed. No animal shall drink alcohol. At least I like this one. Uh, I, I, the, the other ones you can leave, but I, I like this one. No animal shall kill any other animal. I also like uh, this one. And then the last one, very, very important because it latches on Ubuntu. All animals are equal. These were the seven commandments uh, that were trying to demonstrate what I'm talking about when I'm talking about uh, Ubuntu. Then, one day, the animals saw one of the pigs walking on two hind legs like a human being. They look at this one, and the others, they began to follow that pig. Let me just show. Now, this pig now was breaking some of the laws <laughs> because anything that walks on two legs is an enemy. So now it broke all the laws, and other pigs began to behave likewise. And then the other day, two of the other pigs, Clover and Benjamin, discovered that the seven commandments had been removed or erased and had been replaced with only one commandment. The replacement was reading, all animals are equal, but not, but some animals are more equal than others. <laughs> so this one replaced all the seven ones. And uh, it started to be philosophical. No, all animals are equal. Uh, but not and some of the animals are more equal than others. What happened here was that whatever they had would not succeed. Whatever they envisaged would fall apart. So when we embrace the fact that all human beings are created equally in the image of God, it is always a privilege to serve. And as long as the Lord gives us strength to serve, we will do so with all the power that uh, he gives us. Now when we talk about Ubuntu, the other principle that kicks in is the willingness to serve other people, irrespective of their race, irrespective of their gender, irrespective of the age, or status. Now, people pick it up when you are willing to serve them. Sometimes books that talk to leadership talk about a servanthood leadership, but it is part of showing Ubuntu that uh, you are willing to serve. Ubuntu requires also humility. Uh, when we do serve, it is important that we note that we can trample upon each other, unintentionally so. And a good leader that has Ubuntu, when that leader realizes that he has trampled upon another one, that leader will go and say, I am sorry. Irrespective of how old that person is, how that person looked like. So you cannot be able 
to ask for forgiveness and uh, to show humility unless uh, you are willing to say all people are equal. Paul, in Philippians 2 verse 3, says, Do nothing from rivalry. Do nothing from conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourself. Now, I have never felt that simply because I humble myself to some of the people, that the people are taking advantage. It doesn't happen uh, like that. When you've got the principle of uh, Ubuntu and you humble yourself, you are actually demonstrating one of the characters of our Lord Jesus who humbled himself to the point of death, although he was God. And uh, it is important, therefore, that whatever we do, uh, we keep that aspect of humility. I've already said something about caring heart. Caring heart is one of the pillars of Ubuntu. Uh, when you've got that heart, then people feel that indeed you are a parent to them. Theodore Roosevelt said, I quote, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So it doesn't matter that you have a lot of knowledge. Doesn't matter if you've got a lot of money. People don't care about that until they know how much you care. The second aspect I want to focus on is on relationships. I have discovered in the 43 years that building relationships is important. And when you build the relationships that are good, you keep them. But I also realized that there are some dangerous relationships. T.D. Jakes talks about three types of people that we interact with as we are pursuing our God-given goal. A leader will have those people that can be regarded as confidantes. A leader will have those people that can be regarded as constituents. But a leader can also have people, according to TDJs, that are regarded as comrades. Now, Let's look at them briefly. Now, when you talk of confidantes around your leadership, these are the people that are there for you. Doesn't matter what happens. These people are there for you. Their love for you is unconditional. There will come times when they will confront you when you've done something that they don't like, but they still stick with you. In other words, they want the best of you. You get in trouble, and they get in trouble with you. In other words, there are these people that in your leadership, God will bring around you. You need to be able to discern that uh, these are the people that are there. You can open up and share anything with them. They are there to make sure you reach your destiny. Unfortunately, you do not have many of these. I can tell you in my 45 years in ministry, I do not have more than five. I do not have more than five. And uh, some of them are outside of the AFM. But these are the people that each and every leader must identify and keep closer. Let's go to the third one. The constituents. This one, uh, when they surround you, it is not about you. 
It is not about you. It is about the cause. It is about the tribe. It is not about you. Although they come and they talk nice about uh, you, but you know that they will stick with you as long as they think you are on course. They will walk with you. They will labor with you, but never think they are there for you. So if you want to go through this journey, uh, healthy and otherwise, you need to make sure you don't confuse the confidantes and the constituents. Because this group, if they meet someone better than you, they will leave you and hook up with that person. Because they were never for you. Sometimes they will do it in a spiritual way. They will say, we, want, we need more anointing. It seems now we're experiencing, uh, uh, we've got nothing against you. We just need a little bit more anointing. And when they find somebody with more anointing, they leave you. The third one are the comrades. These are strange, strange bedfellows. They are there for a project, and project only. And if you are on their side, they are against what you are against. They are there to make sure that this project is accomplished. They will team up with you to fight the common enemy, but don't be confused by their association. If I can tell you, even when you get married, don't marry a comrade. <laughs> because a comrade comes expecting to get something, and that you're going to do something in return. And when you are no longer able to deliver the goods, the comrade will go and join other comrades. So in your leadership, you've got a lot of this. And the comrades are the ones that sing the loudest. They are the ones that talk the loudest. As long as there is problems, you can do something about them. But you must know that when that project is finished, comradeship is finished as well. But in my stint in the leadership, I have discovered that they are like scaffoldings. Don't be upset when the scaffolding is removed because the building always remains. When we dealt with the issue of unity, we had a lot of comrades. We wanted unity. But we knew that after unity, we were going to lose some. So, in your ministry, there are these people that would come and be passionate about dealing with certain challenges. But I have added one. Uh, to the three of T.D. Jakes. I have added the one that I call conspirators. The conspirators are with you, first of all. But they are there to conspire against you. You can't wish them away because uh, they just come. They don't need an invitation. Their intention is to derail you from your destiny. They are not there for any goal except to make sure that you don't make it. We've got some biblical examples of conspirators. Joseph's brothers, they were family members. 
But when they saw him, they plotted to kill him. When you work for the Lord, there are those that will plan or plot to derail you. In the Bible, we read about Ahithophel. And uh, the Bible says Ahithophel was in cahoots with uh, Absalom. When Absalom wanted to overthrow his father, King David, you will always have the Ahithophel in your ministry journey. But our Lord Jesus had the Judas Iscariot. Now, if you say you are following after the Lord Jesus, you must know that there will be Judas Iscariot. But Jesus was not intimidated, even when he was carrying the purse. He was not intimidated. I'm basically saying the Lord allows certain relationships to come uh, around you, but it is important that when you deal with these relationships, that you are always vigilant. When you have a goal to achieve, you need to always be on your toes. In all situations, focus on Jesus, the initiator and finisher of our faith. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He's always there uh, with you. I know what I'm talking about. Uh, if he knows you and you know him, uh, your journey will not be so difficult. Therefore, it is important to also note that even with the Lord Jesus, he had certain inner circles. Sometimes we don't talk about the inner circles. Others think that the inner circle was Peter, James, and John. But I differ. I think the inner circle, yes, it included John, but it also included the women that walked with the Lord along the way. There are always those people that are there. Those women, they didn't want any recognition. They were there to see that the Lord Jesus will uh, accomplish what the Lord had sent him. But there were also constituents, the Philips of this world, say, no, don't tell us that you are going. You haven't shown us your father. Show us your father now. Uh, they were looking at him as the one that would immediately usher in the new kingdom. So in life, when you are a leader and uh, the Lord has called you, he will be able to assist you to navigate through all of these people. And when he helps you to do that, don't talk about them because you are glorifying them. Always focus on the Lord Jesus and uh, he will make your way succeed. Diligence. Now, in Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 24, the Bible says the hand of the diligent will rule. When you are a leader, you must be diligent. When we talk about diligence, we are talking about doing things at the level where you care, at the level where you are cautious about what is expected from you. It is expected of us to demonstrate that careful and persistent effort in carrying out the responsibilities. There are things in my own experiences, if I did not persist in doing them, they would not happen. But due diligence, it means it has to be done the way it has to be done. Now, one of the things that are very, very difficult, when you are a general secretary, you know, you speak on behalf of all the people. You write the letters, you do all of these things. Uh, but if you do it diligently, people will not hasten to hate you because they understand that um, it is about diligence. When God spoke to Joshua, 
who was succeeding Moses. He said, only be strong and courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Be careful. When you are in leadership, diligence is always expected. It was because of this diligence that some of the people ended up saying, no, Emma Shobo is a man of the book. No, I'm not a man of the book. Uh, I was just trying to do what needed to be done. Paul instructed Timothy to demonstrate diligence in his ministry. Even when it comes to presenting your ministry, even when it, when it comes to prayer, to preaching, make sure that you do due diligence. Familiarize yourselves with the policies and the outcomes that you are expected to deliver. Of course, we can say everything about leadership. But if we say nothing about integrity, then we are not talking about leadership at all. Maybe we are talking about a career. But when you are a leader, make sure that you remain intact. Make sure that your character is intact. Integrity is a foundational moral virtue, the bedrock upon which good character is built. It was C.S. Lewis who said, acting with integrity means understanding, accepting, and choosing to live in accordance with principles of honesty, fairness, and decency. No one is strong enough who can say, I don't have to keep my integrity. Doesn't matter where you are. When you are a leader, your integrity will speak louder than your knowledge at the end of the day. So, uh, when you are a leader, make sure that you are intact. Integrity has to do with the doing of the right thing. When no one is watching, don't act to please people. But even if there is no one, keep your integrity. It has to do with choosing your thoughts and actions based on values rather than personal gain. Martin Luther King Jr. said, the time is always right to do what is right. I have made it a principle in my life that, Lord, hold my heart. If there is something that is going to take away the integrity, help me. I know I can't do it in my own, but a leader pursues integrity. In the biblical examples, we can quote the Egyptian midwives, Shepra and Pua, in Exodus 1. When the children of the Hebrews were killed, they feared the Lord. They disobeyed Pharaoh's rule. And uh, many Hebrew boys were saved. It was not only Moses, but there were others that were saved because there were women in the health sector who retained integrity. Joseph versus Zuleika. When Joseph was at Potiphar's place and Potiphar's wife tried to grab him, he ran. That's why if you are a leader, you must always check if you can run. <laughs> because there are moments where you must run. Not run spiritually, run physically. It doesn't matter what is left behind. But you know that when I'm running away, I'm running with my integrity. So that whatever people will say, they will know that is a man of integrity. Daniel, even when they conspired against him, they agreed, his enemies agreed, we won't find anything untoward with him. Be so faithful that even the one that hates you the most 
will confess that I know that one doesn't take a bribe. Integrity. Especially in our days, in our country, in the continent, we need leaders of integrity. It is my prayer that AFM will have men and women of integrity. That we will not use the resources of the church to cover up unfaithfulness, to cover up infidelity, but that we will walk in honesty with God and in integrity with people. So as a leader, you need to make sure that you keep this principle. Integrity is doing the right thing even when nobody is watching and doing as you said you will do. Integrity is telling myself the truth and honesty is telling truth to other people. So it has an introspection dimension that I myself will know when I'm no longer walking faithfully before the Lord. Everyone makes mistakes, but only a person with integrity owns up. Um, I just want to quickly run to this one. Uh, vision. In my leadership, I must confess that vision, as we are defining it today, came later. It came as a concept that came from the business sector. But uh, when one looked into it, we realized that it is important that when God has called you, that you must be a person who has a vision. Now, I've got a book, The Power of Vision, by George Banner at home. When he talks about vision, he says, vision is a clear mental image of a preferable future imparted by God. That's very, very important. Imparted by God to his chosen servants and is based on accurate understanding of God, self, and circumstances. He highlights four critical issues that as a leader you must have a clear mental picture. You must have a preferable future. You must have a future focus. And you must make sure you are not doing anything out of pride, but that it is an impartation from God. A visionary leader is the one that firstly knows God. A visionary leader, secondly, is the one that knows himself or herself. But a visionary leader is not an abstract leader. He understands circumstances. He understands what are the needs along the way. He understands the opportunities when they come. He can pick up the seasons and he understands the obstacles and the barriers. So along the way, there will always be these things. But it is important for you to make sure that there is a vision. Now, George Banner tries to make a clear distinction between what we call a mission statement and a vision statement. He says, mission statement defines key ministry areas and objectives. Vision statement is specific, customized, and unique. Every time I served as a secretary, I knew that I was serving under leaders. I knew my role. I knew where to come in uh, because it was clear I knew where to play my cards. But a vision statement is specific, customized, and unique. In closing, vision statement has no action verbs. It doesn't say we will do this, we will do this. It says we see this. This is the future that we are seeing. I have seen that AFM in the future is being shifted to the center. The AFM with the current leadership and the leadership that is going to come, it is going to be in the center. It is going to bring about 
uh, another perspective on global issues and on national issues. A mission statement has a lot of actions. We'll do this and that. A vision statement is just a positional one. It's static. It doesn't say we do that. But a mission statement is a roadmap. The Lord that has called you is able to keep you. I don't know what is your situation, where you come from, but the Lord is able to keep you. The Lord who kept me, who is still keeping me, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are not going to die of heart attack. Focus on Jesus. You are not an orphan. You are not a widow. With Jesus, everything is possible. It is my prayer that this impartation will inspire you to go back and do even more. I have said, the Lord with us, we will build the auditorium. We are going to do that. And I said, we will do it ourselves. Among those that the Lord has given us, some are business people, but I said we will not go outside. Uh, we will allow them to build elsewhere. But what God purposes, God pays for that. If God has spoken to you, that will happen. Don't look at the status of people. Look at God. If you are with God, even if you only have widows in your congregation. God will move mountains with those people. Because it is not human being. It is not by power, uh, but it is by the Spirit of the Lord. May the Lord inspire you to be leaders, to be overcomers. May the Lord inspire you to uh, challenge the circumstances. It doesn't matter that economy is bad. You're not going to suffer. It doesn't matter that there are pandemics. Even if you are infected, you will rise again. Because God wants to make sure that you reach your destination. May the Lord keep you and hold you fast. Father, I want to thank you for this moment that I have shared with my colleagues, with my seniors. I thank you, Lord, for you are the same yesterday. You are the same today forever and ever. Even in 2022, you are still God of the miracles. You are still God that come the storms. I pray that you'll take each and every one who heard this impartation by your hand and that they will never be the same again. God bless you. I don't know whether it's still Andres who comes. Thank you so much, Pastor George Mishlobo. Let's give him another hand, please. I just want to share something from my heart, and that is I don't think the church can appreciate him too much. We have to appreciate him. He's really a man of God. He has placed in this church to become somebody special, not for all of us, but for everybody, inside the church and outside the church. We are going to deal with questions. If you have any questions while we have him here, you are welcome just to raise your hand, and we will make sure that uh, we can attend to your questions. Do anybody have a question for Pastor George? You must help me. I cannot see if there's hands. You can just stand. 
Anybody? For those who are interested to buy the book of Pastor George, go, please make an appointment with him. Please get that book. You will thoroughly enjoy that so much. I'm going to ask Pastor Leon Prinsloo, I saw him here somewhere, just to come and end the session for us in prayer, and then we can have a good lunch, and God willing, we will be seeing one another again at half past two on this auditorium number one. Dr. Jan Serfontein will be. He will be speaking about a different topic. And Pastor George Moschlobo will be in the auditorium number two. So please take note of that. Thank you, Pastor Leon. Hallelujah. Can we all stand, please? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Dierbare God en Jemel Vader, dank je voor je gezinde. Lezing wat ons kon bijwoon. Dank je dat het I is wat ons roep. En I is in staat om ons dier te vat. Ik bid dat I elke man van God en vrouw zal zien, zal zelf en zal gebruik tot uitbreiding van I koninkrijk. Raak ons aan, Vader, en zie niet voor ons als ik het bid in Jezus' naam. En al die kennis van die Heer zeggen Amen.